Well, welcome to the Middlesex Moments Radio Show. I'm Anna Wasesha, president of Middlesex Community College, and today I have, I think, my most favorite guest in the whole world, an adjunct professor here, Lisa Moody, former chief of staff for uh, for Governor Jody Rell. I almost made her lieutenant governor, she but she was. started out that way. That's and I right. was I was her chief of staff then as well. Yeah, so yeah. you got you got to uh, yeah. climb the ladder with I her did. to the the pinnacle of power in the state of Connecticut. And it's election season. That'll come as no surprise Mm -hmm. to anybody. So we're going to talk about politics and voter turnout and media and the politics and the way that it gets uh, portrayed on television and Mm -hmm. on the airwaves. And we're on the airwaves here at WLIS, WMRD. So we're part of that. Let's be part of the solution on that score. We need to. It is the crazy season, as they call the election season. I don't know. I can't remember a crazier election than this one. It certainly... uh, given the press plenty to talk about and uh, kvetch about. And I think the people are, frankly, right now, not sure what they're going to do either. I don't think we've seen the old saying, but the lesser of two evils. I don't think there's been a lesser choice. Neither party nominee seems to be popular in terms of trustworthiness and popularity. And so it'll be interesting to see what happens. But these are the critical weeks now, starting particularly next Monday with the first presidential debate on the 26th. So I think it'll probably have the highest ratings ever. And I think it could be a make or break for both candidates. Yeah, I intend to be tuning in myself. Yeah, yeah absolutely. It, most of America will be. Yeah. Uh, what about voting? Let's. You know this stuff backwards and forwards. Mm. So uh, how about re- how you register and when you need to register by and what that means? We actually have um, pretty loose, I'm going to call them loose, but favorable laws in Connecticut for voter registration absentee ballots. People have until November 1st, the election this year is on November 8th, Tuesday the 8th, they have one week prior to register via mail or online. And to register online, they can go to ct.gov, that's the state of Connecticut's official website, and then from there go to the Secretary of State's website, and you'll see in the top left corner, register to vote. And it would take you all of maybe 20 seconds to register to vote. And if you're not sure if you're registered or you moved and you're not sure your registration followed you to your new location, you can certainly check that out in the same location. So again, ct.gov dash Secretary of State. You must need a driver's license or something. You, you do, but you really, to sign up online, you just fill out the information. When your local registrar, so if they do that through the state, the state will then forward it to your city and town. And your registrar, which is what we call our election officials here, There's a Democrat and a Republican registrar in every town or city and borough, and they will double check your, um, you know, your address to make sure you're legit. So that's November 1st, but we also, you can register the day of the election. You can walk into a polling site or you can walk into your town hall on election day itself and register to vote and then vote. And that's called, the name of the law is same day registration. So you have plenty of time and few excuses not to register. And the last item in that same vein in terms of absentee ballots, if you're not going to be in town on election day or you have an illness, say you're in the hospital or you're not mobile, you can't get out, or you're active military and you're on duty, then you can get an absentee ballot. And you have uh, the deadline for that is a little, it's a couple weeks before the election. I can't remember the exact date. But all you have to do is contact your town clerk. They will send you an application. The application, you fill it out, send it back in, and then they will send you an actual ballot. And you can send that in. If you get it on the 1st of October, you can send it in the 1st of October, your actual ballot. So you can do that anytime. And if for whatever reason you're back from duty or you're ill or you're over your illness and you want to go in person, you can do that, and they'll just pull your absentee ballot. Good. So no reasons not to vote this year. Yeah, exactly. Right. Well, we have to take a break. And when we come back, we'll talk about politics and media and voting and whatever we want to talk about, Lisa. Well, we're back to Middlesex Moments Radio Show. Um, it's our, our uh, what is it? I suppose every two years, we, mm-hmm. we, you and I get together and talk about elections. And we were just talking about how to vote mm-hmm. and, and absentee voting. And what we know here at Middlesex is that students who register to vote are more likely to vote. Mm-hmm. So we've got in uh, 19, um, in 1922, well, yeah. <laughs> well, before, just as women were getting the right to vote, I was just going to August 26, you know, 1920. So, right. So, thank you. It's my That's birthday. Right. It's, it's August my birthday 20. as well. Really? August 26. But it wasn't 1920. No. <laughs> Well, that's wonderful yeah. to find out. 
Yes. We have that in common now. We do. We have a bond forever. And I was always so Bella glad. Bella Burgos, yeah. Yeah. I was, I'm always proud of that. And Geraldine Ferraro. Is she also? Was born on that day, and she was the first yeah. woman to ever run as a nominee of a major party. She was running for vice president with Walter Mondale. With my hero. One of my yes, heroes. That's right, from Minnesota. I've got a lot of Minnesota heroes. Well, uh, that's that uh, almost takes my breath away. That That's wonderful. So uh, this was 2012. Yes, it is. Not 1922. And in 2012, 59% of our students were registered to vote, but of those, three quarters, 76% yeah. voted. And then in 2014, when Governor Malloy was on the ballot, and then it was the the uh, more of the local elector, mm-hmm. elections that were up, yeah. 53% of our students were registered and 52% voted. Yeah. And that may be about half turning out. That's unfortunate. That's, it's yeah. unfortunate, but that's that's actually high in my town for local elections, about 30% turnout for the whole town. And that's probably a pretty standard number. One thing that I teach in my class on American national government is that the turnout is always highest for presidential years because people are, they pay attention and you can't help but get away from the news. And then second is statewide election involving a governor. And always the lowest turnout is a local election. But here in Connecticut in 1960, when John Kennedy was running, we had a 76% turnout for all registered voters. That's the highest it's ever been. And in, as of 2000, the last number that I could find, it was only a 58% turnout. So we've gone from 76% to, down to 58 And I wouldn't be surprised if in 8 and 12 it was actually lower than that. Yeah. People are just not voting the way they used to, which I find infuriating. One of the stories I tell my students and trying to get them to understand on many levels the importance of voting other than the issues and how it affects them. I talk about, and I still can never get this image out of my mind, it was an older woman in Iraq who looked like she was about 85. Probably in reality was much younger than that, but it's a hard, hard life. And this was the first time they had had open and free elections ever in Iraq. And this woman with this craggly face, but this beatific, Mm -hmm, beatific, smile had her thumb up and on that thumb was ink purple ink because that's how they made sure people didn't vote more than once they put their thumbs in an ink well so that if they tried to come back through line again they couldn't and she sat there with tears streaming down her face and her thumb up proudly saying i voted for the first time ever in my life i got to vote and you see that stark comparison and against somebody who said eh, i hate all politicians they're all crooked you know, they don't care. They don't represent us. That's how we think in this, in the greatest country in the world of democracy and a republic. And we take it so much for granted. And people don't get involved. And I, I will never get that woman's face out of my mind, out how important it is that we do vote. I know, I know. I, it's, it is hard when you hear that it's Tweedledum and Tweedledee, so it doesn't matter. Do you remember when the 18-year-olds were allowed to vote? Because the age dropped. It did drop. We were... Eight. That's been a long, long time, yeah. though. I, I've been voting the, since I was 18. Yeah, so um, maybe after the Vietnam that War. That was in the 70s, yeah. And there was actually a, a constitutional amendment at the federal level. We have, side fact, 27 amendments to our Constitution. This is one of the things I also stress, that the guys, and I say guys purposely, who got together in Philadelphia in 1787 to put together our Constitution of a form of government never seen anywhere in the world and they did it in 40 days in Philadelphia in the heat of summer. But they were 55 white, wealthy, well-educated men who did it behind closed doors, by the way, which they wouldn't get away with today with our media and our FOI standards, which is a good change we've had. But they put it together, and it's only been amended 27 times. And of the 27, the first 10 were done right then and there, the Bill of Rights. So really it's 17 times, and they were for things like allowing for an income tax, ending slavery, saying if you're a president, you can't serve more than two consecutive terms. Not huge differences. And one of them also was lowering the age to 18. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to say probably maybe the 60s or probably you're right after the Vietnam War saying you're old enough to fight. Right, exactly. You should have some say in the government that's sending you to fight. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, the 16th and 17th Amendment, I was reading about that not too long ago. Um, 16th is income, income tax. tax. 17th is direct voting for your senators. Oh, I didn't it know It used that. to be the legislatures yes. got together, you know, again, yes. wealthy white heels yes, exactly. in a closed room and making yes. a decision about that. And that some of that 
came out of the the progressive idea called the Wisconsin idea. Right, right. And so I was reading about that this summer. And in 1912, the legislative librarian, was, which was a position they created in Wisconsin, wrote this book called The Wisconsin Idea. And one of the first sort of, and it's very crude, graphics in this yeah. book says in 1865, most of the people in this country are basically in what we think of as the middle class. Mm-hmm. You know, they mm-hmm. spanned right. poor to rich, but pretty much right. the middle class. By 1912, they were very concerned. By 1912, 50% of the wealth in this country was held by 1% of the people. Mm-hmm. And then they they projected forward to, like, if we don't do something about the path we're currently going right. down, this is going to get a whole lot right. worse. And it, and it was it, uh, helpful to read about it because so much of the wealth that was sequestered in that top 1% mm-hmm. in 1912, mm-hmm. so 100 years ago, was from extraction, you know, extraction of the natural resources in this yes, country. Yes. So it was timber, oil, mm-hmm. coal, ore. Right. And that, that was, was just here for the period taking. Of the of the great magnets. Right. Of Rockefeller and right. Carnegie and Mellon and you you know mm-hmm. Edison. They this were the houses that many of us who are fortunate to live in Connecticut can easily go to Newport and see those their summer cottages, which are palaces. Right, robber barons. Now yeah. that's one thing I also talk about in my class. American national government sign up. It's how history repeats itself. Mm-hmm. One of my favorite sayings is by George Santayana. He who forgets history is doomed to repeat it. And how much in that time period, from the late 1800s to the early 1900s, it's what's happening now is an accumulation of wealth at the top, shrinking middle class. That's when labor unions came in to try to protect people because the working conditions were so horrible. But we're seeing it again. We're seeing, you know, and and finally when Teddy Roosevelt came in following uh, McKinley's assassination at the hands of an anarchist who basically said government's not working. That sound familiar. <laughs> he broke up the monopolies and he. Right, the Sherman and, Antitrust Act. And right. I look at what we're going through, and we seem to be getting monopolies again. If you look at cable TV, you look at banking, we're losing the numbers so that they're all owned by the, a few people. Mm-hmm. And we're losing our middle class. So I'm, a, I'm thinking we're back to that time period. Right, right. We're returning to that, and we need to address the shrinking middle class. We have to, and that's particularly important to a place like Middlesex Community College because. We're here for the middle class, and this is where they get their start. That's right, yeah. And there's a sort of limited mobility within the, the working to middle right, class right. as well, and that's a problem. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I look at the faces of my students, the younger students, and I worry about them. I don't know how they're... I think they may well be the first generation that doesn't do better than their parents. I mean, every parent wants their child to, to do better in terms of having a more stable job and money in the bank and a nice house and all of that. I don't know how they do it. They have such the college loans they have, and you know they then they get a car loan. And how do they save? How do they save for their own retirement, their kids' college education? How do they save for a down payment on a house? And there's been an odd shift too sociologically because ultimately, these days, to have anything like a middle class life, mm-hmm. you need two incomes. Yes, you do. Right. So it was there was the whole piece about women's liberation right. and entering the workforce right. and being treated equally, right. which was important yeah. uh, for democracy, mm-hmm. but at the same time now, it's not something that people can elect to do, it's, they, can. they have to and do it. And economists have shown that two incomes today equals what one income was in 1950. So when you had Leave it to Beaver and you had the father going to work, what he brought home is equivalent to what mom and dad are bringing home today. And that's if you're fortunate to have a mom and a dad right. in the same household. And if you are headed by a, a single, a female-only household, that's the greatest indicator of poverty in this country. And we have far too many of, you know, female head of households in this country and too much poverty. But how do we get out of that cycle? But that's why elections are so important. Exactly. The, the recurring theme here. Yeah. So, yeah, another piece about the 17th Amendment, the direct uh, voting for the Senate, was they were concerned that the 1% that held mm-hmm. 50% of the wealth in the country in 1912 that they were able to lobby for laws that would be positive for what they were trying to do. They were able to put the people they wanted into office because they financed their campaigns. Mm -hmm. There was just a lot of money in elections. Again, fast forward, same kind of problem. Absolutely. And the Citizens United idea. And And I'm not sure, I don't think Citizens United is working. It was, I think what it was intended to do was a good thing, but it's not working. There's still... There's way too much money in the process, way too much money from 
big donors and corporations. It's just, we need to do something because we need to get the average person in there. What we're seeing are millionaires running for office because they can afford to finance it. We tried to change that in Connecticut with public financing. They've sort of eviscerated the law a bit, but the, the concept is still a good one. Let you go out and raise some money, we'll give you money so you don't have to rely on lobbyists and special interests, or you don't have to be a millionaire to run. Right. But we need to address that on a, on a national level. We absolutely do, yeah. So, well, let's uh, take a break, and we'll come back and talk maybe about media and politics. I would love All to. All right. Well, we're back to Middlesex Moments Radio Show. I'm Anna Wasesha, president of Middlesex, and Lisa Moody is here with me today. She teaches political science here at the college mm-hmm. and has had a long and illustrious career in politics in Connecticut. And we wanted to use this last segment of the program to talk about the impact of the media on politics. Mm-hmm. And, and this fits squarely within our bailiwick, because mm-hmm. although we, I and nobody who works for the state can mm-hmm. campaign for any particular right. person, we can campaign for critical thinking. That's yes. that's our bread and butter. Right. And I worry that those skills are not as well refined as we wish they would be. I think you're right. And I think it starts with critical listening. Because before you can determine and make your own decision, what are you being told and what is the filter they're using to tell you? And I think this is, a, to me, the most fascinating part of this whole year. And we were talking a little bit about it earlier is how the elites in the media are out of touch with the country, just as the politicians are. And it's been fascinating to watch, as a political scientist, if you will, the media doing somersaults all year long, about, particularly about Donald Trump, and saying, how is he still doing well? He just said something that was bigoted. And his poll numbers went up. He just said something mean about John McCain, a POW hero to many. And his numbers went up. He just did this. He just did that. But yet his numbers are going up. And they just didn't understand why. And at the same time, I think they were very critical of Hillary, much more so than they were of Donald Trump. They've given him a 100 passes to any one pass they have given her. One, because he's amusing to them and he gives them a lot of fodder. Um, But the reason he's doing well and he's popular, he talks like the average person. And he's an outsider. And the media's elite are not outsiders. Any of the people you see who are anchors on the news program, CBS, ABC, you name it, even CNN, um, the ones at Morning Joe on MSNBC, they're, all million, they're making millions of dollars a year. I read a story yesterday that Joe Scarborough, just on Morning Joe's making $8 million a year. So if he's doing that on a morning show on MSNBC, what are the evening anchors making? So they can't relate to the person in Kansas or Minnesota or South Dakota who are struggling. They're worrying about paying their mortgage and having enough food for the entire month. They're worried about terrorism. They don't see anything happening. And they're watching people in Washington, D.C. fight with one another constantly and getting nothing accomplished. One of the points I make in my class, going back to 1787 and the 55 white, wealthy, well-educated men, they crafted our entire government in 40 days. And it's only been changed really 17 times since then. These guys couldn't get anything done in 40, 400 days. They couldn't get a simple resolution passed, making it National Ice Cream Day. they fight over that. So I think people have just had it. They're afraid on many levels, in terms financially, jobs, terrorism. And the media is as out of touch as the Washington politicians are. So I think part of Donald Trump's advantage with the people is he's an outsider. And so I think that is part of his charm. And I think the fact he he doesn't talk in political correctness terms. He talks like somebody would talk. When Governor Rell was governor and we were trying to craft a message, I always said to our press guys, I want this to come across as a guy sitting on a bar stool in New Britain. When he hears this, he understands it. And he says, yes, she's right, or I don't agree with her. But I want that to be our approach. And they looked at me, but I want the average person to know what she's doing and why she's doing it. And they don't have to agree with her, and some of them didn't, but they appreciated and respected her for making her decision because they understood it. That's how Donald Trump is approaching this. He's not talking with the Washington filter, the political correctness. He's talking like a guy on a bar stool in New Britain would be talking. And they like that for a change. 
But at the same time, they're also saying, I don't see this guy as president. And they're talking about Hillary saying, I don't trust her to be president. So I don't know. It's going to be fascinating the last few weeks, but the media is not doing a lot to help the situation. In many ways, they've given Donald Trump a pass. And um, I think they're beginning to understand they have been unfair in their treatment and that they need to hold him to a higher standard than they've been holding him. You know, um, I, in the spirit of full disclosure, I never took a political science course. Ah! Oh, I know. If you're I'm, breaking my heart. I have to take one of yours just so I can <laughs> fix that wreck, put it on my bucket oh. list, check it off. But I recall someone saying to me that the basic rule of political science is that people come together and form a mm-hmm. government to survive. Right. They stay together to live the good life. Yeah. And so I, if people want change or they want a trustworthy, yeah. what, what do you think the good life is in the United States anymore? I think it's probably what, I guess, people of our age, but I I don't know. I think it's like it was in the 1950s and 1960s. Get a job. Let me go do my job. Let me make enough money so that I can buy a nice house that we're safe in, that we can have a car or two, that once a week or once every two weeks we can go out to dinner, that we can take a vacation somewhere. It doesn't have to be exotic. It doesn't have to be an island. It could be Cape Cod. It could be the Adirondacks. But ju- and then to be able to retire when I'm 65 and not worry about money. I know that sounds old-fashioned, but I think that's all people want. That's all they want. But our world has changed so much, and there is such uncertainty out there. And they look, unfortunately, they look at Connecticut, and every, it seems like every day there's more bad news. That we're at the bottom of this ranking or this poll, that people are leaving the state, that jobs are leaving the state. So I think right now in Connecticut in particular, we ha- we're in a bad mindset. And we have every reason to be, because the news is not good in Connecticut. You, but you go north to Massachusetts, and they're doing gang, you're going gangbusters economically up there. So I don't know. I think people just want to be safe and secure financially, emotionally. They want to make sure their kids go to school, and that kids are going to be safe at school and safe coming home from school. They don't have big expectations. But what they're seeing are people fighting. They're seeing the talking head media people fighting. They're seeing the politicians fighting. They're seeing nothing getting done or us going, not only are we getting nothing done, we're going backwards. And they see the people that they elect to represent them, and you're exactly right. That's also part of my course about the masses and the elites. The elites, who are those who have the power, whether they're elected officials or, you know, corporate CEOs, you're you're certainly an elite at the college. First, you have to agree, yes, we want to keep our system of power, our system of government, our system of of higher ed, because if there is no middle sex, you can't be the president of it. So first, we have to commit ourselves, come together and agree, this is what we want. We want to have a democracy, or we want to have a community college. And then we have to work together to maintain the system, first and foremost, for each other, so that we can be in a position of power. And every once in a while in this country, something happens, like Shays' Rebellion, or an anarchist shoots a president, as they did with McKinley, as I was talking about earlier. There is, right now, I I don't think I've ever sensed it in my lifetime, a real unease, a real displeasure, a real, not only let's throw the rascals out, and generally when people say that, let's throw all the rascals out, they vote for their guy, because their guy's not a rascal. I know I say that, but my guy, Jim Smith, who's my congressman, He's a nice guy. I've seen him at the coffee shop. I'm going to vote for him, but everybody else should go. Well, if everybody says, throw the rascals out, but my guy's not a rascal, their rascals are all, all rascals are going to get reelected. I sense, though I think it's ebbing a bit out there, and right now it's like, even my guy's got to go. Even my rascal, who I adore, like, respect, he has to go. It's time to get rid of everybody and start fresh. There is a real palpable feeling out there, I think, particularly in states like Connecticut or states that are struggling economically, that people are like, we really desperately need a change. I do think it's ebbing because everybody's been focused on the fighting at the the top of the ticket, Hillary versus Donald. But people are unhappy, and I can see full-scale changes happening. Maybe I'm wrong, but I, I can sense it out there. I, um, I think we're going to have to do another radio show on this, but I'm going to open up a giant topic, which is what about the changing demographic of our country? So I was just at a conference where, the, here's an amazing statistic to me, every day there are 8,000 more people who live in the United States. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, some of them are born here. Some of them migrate here. Mm -hmm. But of those 8,000, 7,000 are people of color. Mm. And I'm not surprised. Yeah. If you come to my class, you'll see that. Exactly. In my class, exactly. the younger people. Right. And, and that's also true for the class that entered kindergarten mm -hmm. this past year. Mm -hmm. the, they, we will become a country that is a majority of right. minority communities. Right. Not that, that all people of color are right. similar. They right. have lots of different backgrounds and histories and cultures. But it's, it seems as though some of the struggle might be a struggle about the old guard and the changing demographic. I, I guess I don't see it. I understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I don't think there is institutional racism or favoritism. And I, we are, are not nearly quick enough, but our Congress is becoming more diverse. For goodness sakes, our first African-American president. We may well have our first female president. So I think changes are being made and we are becoming more diverse in terms of people we are electing to office and people who run agencies or run colleges. We've got a long way to go. Our numbers are not reflective. I don't know if that's necessarily the problem, but I think people have to recognize that it's occurring. And I think we need to hold everybody to the same standard. And I don't think we necessarily do that. And I think our standards have gotten low for everybody. And I think standards in schools are lower than they were when I was a kid. And I don't think that's helpful to the students or to society. So I think what we need to do is have blinders on. So when we look at somebody, we don't see a black face or a Latino face. And in Connecticut, Latino is by far the growing, fastest growing segment. But don't see a color or an ethnicity or a race or a whatever. Just see a student. But I think we need to hold them to higher standards, whoever they are and wherever they came from. Including our elected officials. Correct. So, Correct. so will you come back? I'd love to. Oh, I would this is exciting. <laughs> thank you. So Lisa Moody, thanks so much for being on the show today. Uh, and to all the listeners, thanks for joining us. And uh, if you want to find out more about Middlesex Community College or our fantastic array of political science mm -hmm. courses, you can find us online at mxcc.edu. This is Anna Wasasha wishing you all a very good day.